through the blessings that we have in Christ. Uh, so, Aiden, could you go ahead and pull up that first, uh, the first, do we have that first, uh, the two pictures, the pictures of the circles? Do we have that this morning? There we go. There we go. All right. So here's what Paul is doing as we open up this letter and as he walks through chapter one, he is saying that, hey, we have every spiritual blessing in Christ and he's going to walk through those. But as we continue in this letter, what we're going to see is, you know, sometimes we can look at this and we can say, thank God, praise the Lord on a Sunday, but we don't necessarily feel these blessings on Monday. Right. Uh, So he's going through all the spiritual realities that we have in Christ. But what he's going to do over the course of the book, if we could go to the next one, is showing how these spiritual realities should impact and change our everyday reality. Uh, The way that we live with our family, the way that we uh, interact at work, the way the kinds of neighbors that we are, the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ should impact. They're not meant to be distinct. They're not meant to be separate. Uh, They're meant to be one and the same. Our spiritual realities, uh, living of God, the Holy Spirit living through us, uh, our everyday reality. So, so far we've talked about how we are chosen in Christ. And we saw that that is in in the Old Testament. We see uh, God's choosing of Israel uh, and Paul's going back on those things. He's going back on those uh, stories. He's going back on that narrative of God choosing his people. And through Abram and through Israel, the whole world will be blessed. So he's choosing them out. And we saw that we're chosen in Christ, that God chooses us. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter how terrible we may think that we are, God still says, hey, you know what? You're the kind of person that I would choose. Uh, So we see that he chooses us in Christ. We see that we are adopted uh, to be sons, and that was in Roman culture. That was talking about uh, one of the main reasons why people adopted was to give away an inheritance. Uh, So they would primarily adopt adults in the Roman world, uh, but the Bible says here that we're adopted as children. Uh, So it's out of a heart of love. We saw last week that he's redeemed us, and we saw that that is a reality where redemption is the idea of being purchased out of slavery and being made free, and we are made free from our sin in Christ. So these are the blessings that we have. And now we're going to look at one more as he closes this poem. And verse number, we'll go to verse number seven. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he is bounded toward us in all wisdom and, and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he's purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit, Uh, of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. As we get into this final blessing of Paul's Paul's song this morning, I have a question for you to think about. When I say the word apocalypse, what comes to your mind? When I say the word apocalypse, uh, maybe you're thinking about uh, zombies, you're thinking about the end of the world, you're thinking of buildings burning up. I decided for fun this week to Google the word apocalypse and to see what Google would share with me. So when I Googled it, here's some of the things that I found. I found uh, here are the best states and the worst states to survive a zombie apocalypse. That was the first thing that Google showed me. How do you survive? What are the best states to live in if you want to survive the the zombie apocalypse? Do you want to know where Texas ranked? I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, so, uh, So there was that. There was... Toronto, another article that said Toronto is the worst place in the world. Toronto, Canada, for my Canadians in the room. Uh, Toronto, Canada is the worst place to live if you want to survive uh, the, I think it was a zombie apocalypse. Uh, So I also saw that there was another article that said, uh, here is why AI, artificial intelligence, will either be uh, the savior for the apocalypse or it will be it will be like the beginning of the apocalypse. Uh, so it's either going to rescue us from the apocalypse, or it's going to start it. Uh, that's really comforting, isn't it? Like, oh, here's AI. It's either going to rescue us, or it's going to start everything and kill everybody. Like, here, 
Go play with that. Like, that's not what I do with my kids, right? Uh, but when I say the word apocalypse, those are the kinds of things that come to my mind, which is really interesting because here in Ephesians 1, and he's going to talk about it again in Ephesians 3, Paul is celebrating. Next week, we're going to see him pray for. And in chapter 3, he's going to say, I got saved from because of an apocalypse. So he's going to celebrate an apocalypse, he's going to pray for an apocalypse, and then he's, when he shares his testimony of how he became a believer, he's going to say it was because of an apocalypse. I think that Paul probably means something a little bit different by the word apocalypse than what comes to our mind. But in verse number 8, it says, wherein he is abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, and it says in verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. Paul is celebrating... Uh, Paul is celebrating, and this is uh, in the Greek behind it, uh, he's celebrating an apocalypse. So what does he mean by apocalypse? He uses this language all throughout his letters, and for him it's really special. And we'll see this again in chapter 3, but I've got to share it with you today too, because whenever Paul talks about an apocalypse, he often thinks about, he often goes back to his conversion story. So if you're not familiar with Paul's conversion, here's, uh, here's Paul's story in about 30 seconds. Paul was, uh, before he trusted Christ, he was a murderer. He was, his chief goal in life was to kill Christians. And one day he's on a road to Damascus uh, where he is either going to kill Christians or he's going to imprison Christians. And when he experiences the apocalypse, the risen Jesus appears to Paul in glory. And in this moment, when Jesus shows up to Paul and says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Paul realizes something. He said, he's realizing I have been on the wrong side all this time. Uh, an apocalypse is whenever the word means to be uncovered or to be revealed. Uh, whenever Jesus appeared to Paul, his eyes were open and the truth that Jesus is Lord was revealed to Paul and it changed everything for him. And we'll see that later in Paul's letter. But he says, I was saved because my eyes were closed. I was blind. But then the light of Jesus shone on me and now I see I'm celebrating this apocalypse and the truth was uncovered. So here we see that here, here's what Paul is celebrating. Here's one of the truths that Paul is celebrating in Ephesians 1. He's saying that he's made known unto us the mystery of his will. He's celebrating that God has chosen to take something that was previously unknown, something that was previously unknowable, and now he has revealed that to you and to me. And isn't that an amazing thing? Like, let's just stop for a moment. And before we get into, I'm going to share what he's revealed to you and to me in just a second. But we've got to pause for just a moment and just celebrate and just uh, like sit in the fact that God is the kind of a God. Like what kind of God, what kind of king would say, you know what, I'm going to partner with the people that nobody else would want that we saw in week number one, that I would adopt them to myself and then that I would partner with them. Like that's the, that's the idea of what he's going to reveal, that God is choosing to open our eyes, that he's choos choosing to reveal truth to us and he's choosing to partner with us. Like, what other God does that? Like, we don't live in a world that has that kind of category. We live in a world that is a, that, that is, that the messaging is preached, that it is a dog eat dog world out there. You've got to look out for yourself, take care of yourself, protect yourself, look out for number one, take care of number one. Like, it's a survival of the fittest kind of mindset. That's what we live in. There's nobody who cares for you. You have to care for yourself. Like, that's the, that's the world messaging in our culture. And then the, the messaging of religion religion is that, yeah, if there's gods out there, you've got to do X, Y, and Z to appease them. Uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to make sure that you make your sacrifices, and you've got to make sure that you uh, even hurt yourself. And, and we've seen in idolatry that we saw several weeks ago that they often demand child sacrifice. Like, world religions are all about God saying, hey, you know what? If you just want me to not to be perpetually ticked at you, if you want me to not rain down fire on you, then you better do a bunch of stuff to make me happy. And this is really important because the God of the Bible is quite different than that world, than those world views. Yeah. Uh, what we see here in this text is that God is the kind of God who says, I, I want to partner with you. I want to partner with you. And this isn't a new idea to Paul. This is, actually goes back all the way to page number one of your Bible. Because in Genesis 1 verse 26, when God makes men and women, he says, God made man in his image. Uh, he's made man in his image, after his likeness. And that's a really interesting phrase. 
Because in the ancient world, the, the idea of someone, of a person, being made in the image of God was reserved for kings. It was reserved for kings. Like only kings represented God. Only kings were in God's image. Only kings had that kind of worth. But the story of the Bible is that God made man. God made uh, men and women. God made humankind in his image. And the idea is that, hey, I'm, I'm making you for a purpose and I'm making you for partnership. So he gives them authority. He says, you'll have dominion over the, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, now, over everything that creeps on the earth. Like that's what God does. From the very beginning, God desires to partner. And of course, because of our sin, all of that gets messed up. Uh, all of that, because of our rebellion against God, all of that gets ruined. But God isn't done with that kind of pursuit. Uh, because as you walk through the story, when you get to Genesis 6, the Bible says that every thought of man's heart was only evil continually. But there's one person who finds grace in the eyes of the Lord, who walks with God. So God says, I'm going to partner with you. And he has Noah build an ark. And then you fast forward to Genesis 12. Whenever people are, continue, are living in idolatry again, but God chooses out Abram and God says to Abram, hey, I'm going to partner with you and I'm going to bless the world through you. Like that, When you go through the Bible from the very beginning all the way through, you see that we have a God. The God of the Bible is a God who wants to partner with you. That is something that is amazing. That's something that's worth celebrating. It says he's made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Like just, just because he's that good. He wants to partner with you. He says, according to the pleasure which he has purposed in himself. And then in verse 10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Uh, so there is a point. There is a coming day. He is working everything together that in the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, which are on earth. So we see this. Uh, so we see this idea whenever the, the mystery is revealed that God is working all things together to restore it back, uh, to restore it back under the rule and reign of King Jesus. Uh, he is on a mission of restoration. He's on a mission of restoration and he's sharing that with you because he wants you to be a partner with him in that work of restoration or in that work of reconciliation. And what an amazing thing that is that we have that kind of a generous God who says, hey, even though you rebelled against me, even though you spat in my face, I want to partner with you who believe in Christ and I want you to help bring reconciliation uh, all around you. That's what God is doing and that's the kind of generous God that we have. Uh, I read this story in the 1300s. There was a king named, uh, he was, uh, I got to look it up because I'm going to mess up his name. I think it was King Mansu. King Mansu Musa. And that's probably the only time that I'm going to say his name this morning. Uh, so, but King, uh, it's Mansu Musa. So I call it, not Eminem, but we'll just call him King M. King M is this king in Africa, and he was known for a couple of things. He was known for being incredibly wealthy, and he was known for being incredibly generous. Uh, in fact, he was so wealthy that on a particular trip, he was traveling through Egypt. And when he was going through Egypt, he gave gold out all over Egypt. And he gave so much gold out in Egypt that it drove down the value of gold. Like it plummeted the value of gold for the next 12 years in Egypt because he gave so much of it away. Like the value of gold became the value of like, of, of so, it became the value of like practically nothing because he gave so much of it away. But there's no other king who says, you know what, I'm going to not just give of my wealth, I'm going to give partnership. Like, I'm going to partner with you. I'm going to bring you with me along this journey. So it says that he's bringing all things together and want all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and on earth. God is on a restoration. He's on a restoration mission. Uh, he's on a mission for you. Because we all, because we can go back to the beginning of the Bible and we can see the failure of humanity as a whole. But the fact is, you and I are sinners before the Lord. Uh, you and I are broken before God. And we experience that all the time. Like we experience the effects of our own brokenness, uh, the shadow of it, even, uh, even today, even, even, even in our everyday lives. Uh, there was, okay, I'm, I wasn't planning on sharing this story, uh, but I'm going to share it. Uh, so, so you guys uh, that have been here at New Life for a while, you you've been with me through some of the ups and downs of my of my weight loss journey. Um, so uh, I won't tell you what I weighed because uh, that's in all love. 
It's not your business. Uh, so, but I weighed, I weighed a certain amount, and then I went on keto. I did the keto, I did the keto diet, and I stuck with it for, for quite a while. And I dropped, I think I dropped, let's see, I'm in my head, because I'm not gonna tell you the numbers. Uh, I think I dropped like 40, 40 to 45 pounds. Uh, over the course of like six or seven months, I stuck with keto, it worked, it was awesome, and I kept it off for a while. And then, if you look at me now, and for those of you that have been around here for, for a while, well, you know that I didn't stick with it, and I didn't stick with it, and that's not gone well for me. Uh, so I put on quite a bit of the weight that I previously had. Well, I've been, you know, for me, I've been stress eating, and all the things that I preach to you guys about, about not looking to other things to be a functional savior for you, yeah, I didn't listen to my own messages. I was looking to food, definitely, to bring the comfort and peace and joy that only Jesus is supposed to bring, and that took, that took, that looked like Oreos and milk, a lot of Oreos <laughs> and a lot of milk. Um, so I ate, I put on, I put on weight, and now I'm at a point where I am feeling it, where I'm feeling, uh, where I've been feeling terrible all the time, and Adrian and I have been talking about it, about like, it's just not healthy the way that I've been eating. So I fell for a YouTube scam. Uh, I was, I was going to buy an exercise program. I was going to buy, I was going to buy a fitness program. And so I did it. I bought it. And, you know, I watched all of the videos, all of the science. And I thought, Hey, this is great. This is awesome. And Adrian and I talked about it and we agreed that, Hey, you know, the $60 program for a 90 day exercise program like hey that's a good idea we have uh we can afford it right now and hey that works let's let's spend it the sixty dollars is worth the investment for my personal health right so whenever i'm in the checkout the checkout lane like the the ceo of this company or whatever he has one more video that you have to watch and what i learned is there's always one more video that you have to watch uh but there's one more video before you purchase your workout program and it's this he says Listen, we have found this groundbreaking technology, uh, this groundbreaking vitamin supplements uh, that will just make your fat melt off your body. And, and he had a lot of scientific language for it. And it made a lot of sense. And to make matters worse, it was like, hey, if I buy it today, like if I check out and then I go back to the website and just try to buy the supplements, then I won't get it at the same price. But I can get it at a great price. I can get it at a great price if I buy now. So guess what I did? I bought now. And I spent a lot more money than $60. And I didn't talk to Adrienne about it. And then it came time for us to reconcile our budgets. And then I had to confess to her, yeah, I didn't talk to you about it. And they promised that I wasn't completely satisfied. It was a money back guarantee. No. But I don't know if I'm going to get my money back. <laughs> and to be honest, like more than anything, and so I'm confessing my sin to you guys this, this morning. It's good for my soul. Y'all are my free therapy. Thank you. Um, no, here, like here was here was the reality. Um, one, we already talked about me looking to something like food to be a functional savior for me and that's caused me to that like that false belief has led to me overeating which hasn't been good for my physical health but then whenever i got into this program and i you know the the get the get fit quick scheme um i did not intentionally and i apologize i did apologize i said sorry uh, to my wife later but like i didn't talk to her about it so spending money, I kind of broke a little bit of trust. And here's the reality, I, I've paid for it. Not with my Chase account, but in my relational capital. Because of my sinfulness. Because of my brokenness. And that's something that we all experience to some degree, in some way, shape, or form, all the time our own dishonesty, our own pride, our own self-righteousness in various ways. And all it leads to is brokenness and all it leads to is death. But God is on a rescue mission. He is transforming, he is sanctifying, he is purifying. And eventually there will be no more sin and there will be no more death. But right now what we see here in this verse is that God is on a mission to rescue and redeem and restore you, the brokenness that's in you, the brokenness in me, and it's going to extend to all of creation. 
to the point where Jesus, even on the cross, he says something. It's really interesting. He says to the thief on the cross, he says this, and he carries this, this language. He says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, you'll know what's really interesting about the word paradise is that the word paradise is actually the word that means garden. So he says to the people on the cross today, you're going to be with me in the garden. Which goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And you see the Garden of Eden at the beginning of the story. And at the end of the Bible, you see this garden city. So the idea is that God is on this work. He's on this restoration work where he's taking all of us back to, he's taking us back to Eden. So he says that in the fullness of time, he's making all things. Uh, he's setting all things right, including you, including me. He's making all things right. And that's what he is doing. That's a beautiful, and that is a wonderful promise in whom we have obtained an inheritance. So if we, if we are, sorry, in verse number 10. So if we believe this as a church, if we believe that Jesus rescues and redeems you, and he rescues and redeems me, and he's transforming us over time, and if we believe the good news that God is at work, and he's going to, he's going to rule and reign uh, beautifully like it was in the garden, and he's working all things together, like how do we as believers live? One, we live where that reality, where we're living for that reality, we're living into that reality rather than my own brokenness. Like if I understand that Jesus is rescuing and redeeming and restoring me, then you know what? Whenever I sin, like I did this week, like I just told you about, instead of trying to hide, instead of trying to, instead of trying to hide, instead of trying to like double down, instead of trying to justify myself, I can say, hey, you know what? There was sin and brokenness that was revealed in me, and that was a gift of God's grace. That was a gift of the Holy Spirit, and now He's changed, and now I'm going to surrender to the Holy Spirit's work, and I'm going to become more like Jesus because of His grace at work in me. So that's what it looks like as a believer to live with the fact that to live in light of the reality that Jesus. Jesus is changing and transforming even me. The second thing that it should do is it should make us great ambassadors. It should make us great ambassadors. Because here's the reality. Whenever I, like, I can share with you my brokenness like I just did, because you know what? One, I know that I'm forgiven. And two, I know that God is going to use it for good. So I can say, hey, you know what? I really, really messed up this week. I did. But Jesus is changing me and he's molding me and he's teaching me through this. So I can be honest about the work that God's doing in me, but I can also celebrate that, hey, you know what? I'm not going to make, hopefully, by God's grace, I'm not going to make that kind of mistake again. So whenever I live in the workplace, I can, I can live in the workplace as an ambassador, not as someone who has to put up this front of being like a super Christian, uh, but you can live even in your workplace uh, with the grace of knowing that, you know what? I am a work in progress. I'm a work in progress, and I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to live in light of the reality of what he's doing. I'm going to shine the light of Jesus, and I'm also going to be, I'm going to be honest about the work that he's doing in me, and I'm going to tell other people about the work that he's doing in me, and I'm going to tell other people about the work that he can do for them. When we believe in something, whenever we, when we really believe in something, we get excited about it, and we talk about it. When we get excited about something, we, 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 when we get excited about it, and we talk about it. So I'll give you another example. So I have... Uh, I have a, a wedding ring, uh, but it's called, specifically, it's called an aura ring. Uh, I don't know if you've seen commercials for aura rings, but one day I was with Colt and I think David, who's not here today, uh, Colt and David, and we were at, and Tony, and we were at a Mexican restaurant, and it was a really cold day. I think it was last February, and and I had my wedding ring, and I was leaving, I was leaving Teotihuacan up Irvington, and as I got out, I put all the stuff in the back of my car, and I looked down, and I realized that my ring had fallen off. Uh, my, my wedding ring had fallen off. So I looked all over the restaurant. Like, we tore the restaurant apart looking for my wedding ring. I looked all through my car. I looked all through the parking lot. I could not find it anywhere. So I needed to get a replacement ring, and I did some research. I did some looking online in case you're wondering, I'm a bougie person. So I, I was looking for, hey, what would be a great ring to get? And I found this aura ring. You see, this ring tracks my activity and it tracks my sleep. And every morning it tells me, hey, this is how you slept. So it gives me a score. And, and man, it, it's awesome. I, I love it. And after I got it, I got so excited about it that I started talking to everyone about my aura ring and how it was giving, how I was having such more such effective sleep and how it even predicted whenever I was going to get sick. And it told me, hey, you're, uh, 
you know, you didn't sleep good last night. It was probably because you ate Oreos and milk. Uh, and it didn't tell me the Oreos and milk part. That was a little bit of an exaggeration. But it would even tell me, like, hey, you probably ate too much last night or something like that. So try doing better this next. And it, it would just give me all this information. And I loved it. And I was telling everybody about my aura ring. And then I got so excited about it. And I was telling people about it. And apparently I was talking so much about it to my sister and my brother-in-law that they said, you know what? This thing sounds so cool. We're going to get one, too. I got excited about it because it was changing me. So I was talking about it and then other people wanted what I got. If I believe that Jesus is changing and transforming and that he's working something good, he's, if I believe this, I'm gonna get excited about it. I'm gonna talk about it. And I think other people will want what you got. So we see he's on this, we see that he is on this divine rescue mission and that all sounds wonderful. And to make it even better as we come to a close, he makes all of these promises, but how can we be assured that these promises will be reality? And that's where he closes, that's where he closes this celebration uh, in these verses. It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance in verse 11, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So let's just pause for a moment. That, that being a recipient of these blessings is built on the condition of faith in Christ. If you've never turned to Christ from your sin, recognizing that you needed rescue and you needed redemption from Jesus, if you've never put your faith and trust in him, then this is sad news. But the, these blessings are not for you, but they can be. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone to be your Savior, to be your Redeemer, to be your Rescuer, today you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and be rescued and redeemed. So we see that these promises are for those who not do enough, not who work enough, not do who do enough good deeds, but for those who believe, for those who trusted in Christ. But he says that we have obtained in this, this inheritance. It says that for this inheritance, in verse 14, it says... That he is the which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So Paul closes by talking about this inheritance that we have, uh, this inheritance that we have in Christ, this inheritance that we have in God. And whenever we think about inheritance, I don't know about you, but I, I like start daydreaming. When I think about an inheritance, I, I have this like daydream, uh, and maybe you have it too, where like you have this like rich, super rich uncle. That, of course, you don't know. Like, that would be sad if you knew this rich uncle. But, like, you have this really rich uncle who just, like, passes away and leaves you an inheritance, who leaves you a ton of money. Like, I don't know. Like, you don't have to raise your hand. I won't make you. I'll confess, I'll confess my uh, dark thought. I won't make you do that this morning. Uh, but, like, this dream of, like, hey, there's this person that I don't know who leaves me this huge inheritance, and I have it. And the Bible says that we have this inheritance, there is this inheritance that God has for you, but what's really beautiful about this is that whenever Paul uses the word inheritance, he's probably referencing back to when, when God talks about an inheritance back in Deuteronomy. And when God talks about an inheritance, here's how he talks about an inheritance. He doesn't talk about land. He doesn't talk about property. He doesn't talk about money. When God talks about an inheritance, he talks about relationship. He says, this is the inheritance that I will be your God and you will be my people. Here's this inheritance that God talks about. You get me and I get you. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing that like when God talks about an inheritance, he says, you are my inheritance. Like that God will look at you as that valuable and that precious that he would say, hey, you are an inheritance for me and I will be an inheritance for you. And we see that God is working all things together for good. So there's this amazing, there's this amazing truth that we get God and we get God in glory where there's no more sin, where there's no more brokenness, where there's no more emptiness, because he's reconciling all things together, we get God in glory. And you know, a lot of times we, we think about that and we start singing about heaven. And I told you at the beginning that I'm from Arkansas, and in Arkansas we would always sing this song, not, and maybe you guys probably haven't, but, but I grew up singing this song, like, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old, and someday yonder where we'll never more wander, we'll walk on streets of purest gold. 
And when we think about heaven, we often sing about the golden streets, and we think about we sing about the pearly gates, and we sing about uh, we sing about the mansions, and we sing about like all of those amazing things. Somebody recently sent me a song about heaven, where it's talking about how I'm going to walk on, well, I'm going to walk by the river with grandma, or or something like that. And that's what we think about when we think about heaven. But when God talks about heaven, and when Paul talks about heaven, he talks about something a little bit different. Like those things are wonderful. But whenever Paul talks about eternity. He says, here's the inheritance. You get God. When he talks about it in 1 Thessalonians, he says, he, whenever he, Paul talks about death in 1 Thessalonians, he says, uh, that when, like, that to, uh, he says to be absent with the body is to be present from the Lord. I think that's in Corinthians. But at the end, he says, uh, when we die, like he skips over all of those mansions and golden streets and all those things, and he closes by this. Like, here is the celebration of even death, that so shall we ever be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. When Paul thought about all that God's doing, the inheritance was God himself. That's the inheritance. So, he says we have this inheritance. But until then, until we receive this inheritance where we get God in glory, he says, which is, uh, in the previous verse it says, the Holy Spirit which is the earnest of our inheritance. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. Now, if you're not familiar with the term earnest, the idea of earnest is like a down payment or earnest money. If you were going to purchase, if you wanted to purchase a house uh, and you find the house of your dreams and you say, hey, I want this house, but before you put the down payment, you put down some earnest money. And the idea is, hey, I am so serious about this house and I'm going to put this money down I'm going to put this money down so that you take it off the market because I want it. So, and it even comes before the down payment. Uh, so he, he puts it, the money is put down, and he, like you don't just get to take it back. I'm putting the earnest down so I get this house. And here's what God says. Someday you have an inheritance where you're getting me and I get you in glory. But until then, you get the Holy Spirit of God. You get the Holy Spirit of God who is the down payment who is the earnest. You get the Holy Spirit to be with you through the everyday stuff of life. And here's what's so beautiful about it, is that God says, someday you'll get me, but until then you get me. Like someday, glory, you'll get me, but until then you've got, the whole, you, you've got me. The difference is that someday we'll get God in glory, but until then he'll be with you in the messiness of life. Someday we will be with God in glory. And he's working everything together for that beautiful reality for that beautiful someday. But until then, you get God in your mess. And in that mess, by his grace, he will redeem and transform you. By his grace, he is making you more like Jesus. By his grace. No wonder Paul opens up this song when he talks about all of these realities. No wonder he opens up by saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And if Paul's going to sing that song, then I think that we probably should too. Let's stand together and let's sing Ephesians 1-2.